I am beginning my demo in the Office 365 uh, Admin Center. This is the new Admin Center that was introduced in early 2016. And what I'm using for a tenant is a trial tenant for E5 license. Um, so there's really a brand new tenant here with no um, uh, real uh, volume of users in it. In fact, the trial is limited to 25 licenses. So I have two users. Uh, the first one is the admin user that I created when I requested the trial. And the second user is um, a user that I created uh, through our uh, web interface, through the Chaosoft Administrator web portal. And this is a full hybrid user. So I have two users, they're both licensed. So I'll jump over to the Office 365, uh, sorry, I'll jump over to the Chaosoft Administrator web portal and I'll go ahead and sign in. And then I'm going to jump to looking at the Office 365 licensing dashboard uh, to see um, that I just have those two users out there that are licensed. So I have uh, 25 licenses total to assign. That gives me 23. So I can actually create uh, and assign uh, 23 new users. In this demo, we're only going to create five users uh, to walk you through the process. But uh, again, um, I'm using a trial tenant, so uh, no, no magic up, no nothing hidden up the sleeve, so to speak. So I'll jump over to Office, uh, sorry, to Active Directory. Um, this is a standard Active Directory, nothing special. I have a OU where I'm going to create the accounts. Um, nothing there. I can do a refresh. You'll see there are no accounts here. I also have a group out there called full-time employees, which I'm going to automatically populate during this process as well. And finally, uh, for the bulk of the demo, I'm going to spend time in the Chaosoft Administrator Automation uh, Console. This is the uh, primary console for uh, creating automated um, processes. Uh, some people call them run books. Other people would call them workflows. Uh, and it's also where you configure delegated access for the roles that allow people to use the web interface or the web portal that I just showed you. So I can have a service desk with different um, access levels um, that can perform uh, on-premise tasks, cloud tasks, or, or hybrid tasks. And all that's streamlined with the most advanced product in the space um, for doing those types of, of operations. But today we're going to talk about automated provisioning. So here I've created um, a set of rules uh, or a, a run book, so to speak, a list of things that I want to do to import users. And the very, very first one is to grab a text file and then create some accounts in Active Directory. So what I'm showing you here on the right hand side uh, is what we call a rule. It's going to query that text file. And if I take a quick peek at it, you'll see the text file is very simple. First name, last name a description for the user. You'll see that we do have location, we have phone number, uh, and then I have a column over here that's called type. So I have uh, the type set to hybrid. I can mix and match this because we do both on-premise uh, provisioning as well as the Office 365 provisioning or Azure AD provisioning. Uh, in this case, I just have five users that'll all be uh, for hybrid. Notice I have no address information here, so that's something that's missing. So once we've grabbed this detail from a text file, we're going to pass it uh, to uh, the action section. And this is where it's going to create the accounts in, in a, a, a OU, a beginning OU, so to speak. Uh, and we can have a rule uh, that will later move that uh, user based on whatever rules that I want to establish for where user account should reside. But for now, it's going to be created in the first location. And then I have just some default settings I have to make choices about and how I want the account names to be set up. Uh, and how I want the account to be actually created, enabled, disabled with a static password or complex password, etc. Once uh, the users are created, uh, it's going to then run the dynamic attribute rule. And this dynamic attribute rule looks at the user's location and then retrieves a list of addresses and populates the addresses. So this rule could actually be used not just for updating addresses. If you had job codes and you wanted to expand those out into job title, department, uh, maybe additional information like certification information, you could, based on um, a job code that may be given to you during the provisioning process, expand that out and it would populate all that information and standardize it across your directory. Uh, then we're going to set home folders, home profiles. Uh, if they are a remote user, a hybrid user, they'll get a remote exchange mailbox on-premise 
By the way, this is not a, a requirement. It's just one of the options that we have. We're going to create the Office 365 account for those uh, new Active Directory users. And in that case, those Active Directory accounts that we're creating, sorry, the uh, Office 365 accounts that we're creating are pre-integrated with Directory Sync and Azure AD Connect. So that once they're created, um, we don't actually have to run a script to do Directory Sync um, you just let your synchronization occur naturally every uh, half an hour if it's Azure AD Connect or every three hours if it's DirSync. Um, and then it'll pick up additional attributes. But we tell uh, the synchronization tool about the account, so it's pre-set pre up for um, synchronization. There's no mistakes. There's no um, ability for that tool to create a separate account. There's no mismatching or orphan accounts. So that's very different from tools that require you to run synchronization or require you to buy an additional product to do synchronization. Uh, then we're going to assign a license. So here you'll see that we have um, an E5 license. That's the type I have in my tenant. And I've just turned on a couple of these options. Now there are some of these options that are on for the entire tenant. Um, so I don't have to touch those. Actually, we ignore those. They can be set by Microsoft on a tenant by tenant basis. So you'll see that here at the end of the demo. Then we're going to add in place hold. We're going to enable archive for the mailbox. If these were on-premise users instead of hybrid users, then we would give them an exchange mailbox instead. So for example, if I'm an educational institution, I might have my staff on-premise and my students in the cloud. Or if I'm uh, a hospital, I might have my doctors and full-time nurses uh, on-premise, and I might have visiting doctors uh, or st uh, student nurses uh, in the cloud. So I can mix and match these rules by just adjusting them slightly to, uh, to meet my requirement. But I could have on-premise exchange mailbox, we can also enable them for on-premise Skype. Uh, because of this license that I'm granting in step six, they will get Skype online, Skype for Business online. So they're going to get Skype if they're in the cloud. If you have a Skype server on-premise uh, or a link server on-premise, they can be given link. And then finally, um, I could set also, by the way, uh, Skype policies, link policies, etc. And then finally, uh, if the users need to be moved into a different OU, um, Maybe you have different divisions or regions and you want to put these uh, based on location or some other information into those. You can define a set of rules and it will actually move the users. Uh, so in this particular case, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start this up. And then after I run this first rule, it's going to call all the other rules in this workflow. So it tells me that it submitted it to the service. I come up and I take a look at my little uh, light bulb up at the top and it tells me that it's working on the first rule. Uh, once these users are created, I actually created something also called uh, a Chaosoft Dynamic Group. These are not necessarily like what you might be familiar with in Exchange called a Dynamic Distribution Group. This is dynamic rules or rules that will dynamically populate a group. Uh, it can be a security group, uh, it can be an on-premise group, a cloud group, it doesn't matter. We work with all the group types. And I've created a rule that simply says for full-time uh, users in this um, uh, process, go ahead and include them into the full-time users group. So the very last step will be um, to run that particular um, query. And then on a daily basis, every couple of hours, this will run uh, if I enforce it and up to keep the updated uh, membership. So if somebody leaves the organization, it removes them. If somebody new gets added, either through this process or through the web portal, uh, it will um, add or remove them appropriately. Uh, so uh, let's see where we are now on the rules. It's working on the Office 365 mailboxes. So if I jump over to Office 360, uh, sorry, to Active Directory and I do a refresh, I'll see five new accounts. Excellent. And if I open up one of those accounts, uh, even though I didn't have the original address information, I see it's been populated. Next, we'll jump back over to my web portal and we'll look at the Office 365 Admin Center. And I'll just do a refresh here, and we'll see how far it's progressed in getting uh, the users created. Now, uh, Office 365, Azure AD, sometimes take a little bit of time to complete the work and then display it on my uh, console. So sometimes it'll come back out with the users first being unlicensed. Uh, well, in this case, it was, it was uh, fast enough in the background to get it done. So these users have actually been enabled for... Um, a full E5 according to the policies that, uh, that uh, I had run earlier. So if I come out and I actually look at the product license for this user, you'll see, if I look at the details, that all the items that I turned off are off and all the items I had on are on, except for those that are per tenant. So for example, this is per tenant, can't be individually assigned, so it's left on 
uh, the tenant takes care of that. Uh, it is possible to have uh, conflicting options if you're having uh, complex licensing scenarios. We handle uh, license conflicts with uh, license precedent, and we also uh, retain uh, information about um, the different um, uh, components or services, even if you change the license. Uh, we're the only solution uh, at this point uh, besides Microsoft that actually does that. So now I have fully provisioned these users. So I have my five users ready to go. Uh, directory sync will um, happen eventually. And then the additional attributes, if I have custom attributes that I did not set during the provisioning process, uh, those will be created. Now I'll now go over and we'll take a quick look at uh, the web portal again. And we'll see if I refresh my licensing. So it's going out and retrieving the licensing information. So I see I now have seven used. And if I come back and take a look at my original rule that I executed, you'll see that I've run this several times with varying amounts of users. And now I have um, a list of my users and I can actually go out and uh, check my group here. So there's my full-time user query. Let's see that it ran. Uh, that's for the second time I ran the demo, good. And if I actually come out and look at that group you will see that my full-time users group is now populated with my new users. And last but not least, uh, we also have generated a series of reports telling me that these steps operated. Uh, so I can actually see what operated. They're very simple reports. We'll just look at them in Chrome. Uh, they're HTML, so I can uh, send them to other people, but it tells me these users were provisioned. It gives me the distinguished name, the object ID, and I get similar details for the other systems as well.